Okay, good evening and welcome. We're at the top of the hour. I'm going to start. I expect we'll have a few more people joining. Welcome to this very large dinner party in our virtual home. I uh, would love very much if we were doing this in person somewhere to meet, uh, to see familiar faces and meet some new folks as well. But here we are, and I'm glad you're here. I'm Maurice Carter. I'm the president of Sustainable Newton. We want to welcome you to our virtual civic dinner as part of the Drawdown Georgia civic dinner series. And this particular evening, we're going to talk about food and agriculture. I am going to introduce our, our panelists, special guests in a moment who are here from our local farms. But before I do that, I kind of, to kick this off, wanted to give a very brief overview of what is Drawdown Georgia. And then from there, kind of talk about what discussion topics they're focused on. And then hear about who've been doing work in this area for really, you know, in some cases, a very long time now. And then importantly, though, we want to hear from all of you because the idea of a civic dinner is it's discussion, it's interactive, it's exploring the topic together. And, and uh, even in this virtual space, we have an opportunity to, to do that. If those that aren't familiar with the term drawdown, I'm gonna, um, it's, I'm probably one small, oh, look, it's not even gonna pick it up. There's a book by a gentleman, actually the author is Paul Hawken, but Paul Hawken was just the editor who pulled together research from a group of scientists, policy experts and researchers who at a global level were looking at the subject of drawdown. And what drawdown is, is that point where as a, as a society, as a planet, we are taking more carbon out of the atmosphere than we're putting into it. And we're starting to see carbon levels in the atmosphere go down. And that's very important from a climate change perspective. And their goal was to look at all the things we might do and say, by 2050, what are the 100 key areas that we should focus on? 100 actions that if we took these actions, we would achieve that drawdown. And, and they looked at many things and came up with a list of 100. And they did that based on you know, really getting down to that, you know, what's feasible, what can we do and what has the greatest impact. So these are the actions that would have the greatest impact and get us where we need to get to by 2050. Drawdown Georgia is a project that was launched by the Ray C. Anderson Foundation here in Georgia. They actually have been at work on this for over a year. They had formally launched back in October. And they, Drawdown Georgia is made up of researchers, scientists, experts at all of our major universities in the state of Georgia, as well as, as I say, the nonprofits like um, the Ray C. Anderson Foundation. So what they did was they took that list of 100 projects that the Drawdown folks had looked at globally and said, this is Georgia. Some things like wind, as an example, aren't really feasible in most of our terrain, whereas solar power we're very well positioned for. You know, some parts of the country, like agriculture is less of, less of a feature than other things. So, so they looked at Georgia and the drawdown list and analyzed them in the great detail and came up with a list of 20 areas that Georgia could focus on. And they set their time horizon as 2030 and said, if we did these actions, we could achieve, you know, and, in, and they set targets, we could achieve an important reduction in carbon by doing these things. And those, those 20 areas kind of broke out into five sectors, electricity, building and materials, transportation, land sinks, and then uh, food and agriculture. So they're having dinners like this, getting citizens like us to have these dinners all around the state on all of those areas. And we wanted to focus on food and agriculture because it's, it's a, a very prominent aspect of the community where we live. Uh, we've got folks who've been working in this area. Uh, and so we've been fortunate enough to get some of them on the, on the meeting with us tonight. Um, why food and agriculture is a climate change focus. The drawdown researchers estimated that basically 25% of the carbon in our atmosphere that we put in the atmosphere as human beings comes from food related activities. So the processes of growing food, distributing it, uh, and what we do with food that we don't eat and how, where it ends up. So 25% of that total target of carbon in our atmosphere comes from food. So this is a very big area of focus. Uh, and so in, in our discussion 
tonight and in in the in in drawdown georgia they're looking at the question how do we transition to sustainable food systems what does that look like in georgia in newton county in our homes and how can we be a leader georgia be a leader and give me just a second i need to admit some more folks okay so how can we lead in that so that's a question that we're going to come back around and put to everybody here tonight because it's uh, the idea of, again, of a civic dinner is conversation. But we wanted to start out with our experts, our farmers in our community, people that we know as friends, but we also um, eat well because we have them here. So I'm, uh, I've got here with us tonight, we've got Nicholas Donk and Jenny Gerard from Crystal Organic Farm in Newburn. Sarah Vinson with Yellow Hen Farm in Covington. Nathan Fussell, or Fussell, and Nathan, I'll let you uh, correct me when we get to, to your section, and uh, with Twin, Camp Twin Lakes in Rutledge, and then Daniel Parson is the organic farmer at Oxford. Daniel had a, uh, a situation with his family tonight that he helped put this together. He couldn't be here, but Catherine Reuter is with us to represent Oxford college farm and that's very appropriate because Catherine actually was one of our founding board members when we started sustainable newton back in uh, in 2018 so um but we're glad to have all of them here and we hope that this event is an opportunity to increase your awareness of these local gems in our community the actions that they've been doing to make farming organic, regenerative, sustainable. But again, local farms mean local customers. So we're trying to connect these farms to our, 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 our neighbors because it's good for all of us. And uh, so we're gonna get to know them a little bit. We're gonna talk about what they're doing. And I just wanna say, personally, I have a great respect for the passion, commitment and work ethic that these people put into their work. So, um, Everybody on, I think I've got you muted when you join. Uh, we're going to have our farmers talk. If you have questions, you can raise your hand or you can unmute yourself and ask the questions. But we're going to try to get through this section and then uh, you'll be broken out into smaller groups and you'll each have one of these farmers with you to talk about some of the things you may also be interested in. So um, I first met Nicholas uh, my memory is back in the 2003, 2004 timeframe when uh, my wife and I would shop at a little short lived uh, local farmer's market here in Covington called the Square Market. And we loved his food. We drove down. We were living in Conyers at the time. We drove down to shop every week because we were so impressed with the quality of what we got to eat. And uh, that was, as I say, you know, about 17 years ago or so. And Nicholas was already an established pioneer in Atlanta organic farming at that time, a founding member of the Morningside Farmers Market. And then Jenny, his partner, who is also with us, came along and uh, I, I let them tell us exactly when, but she worked her way into the farm and into Nicholas's heart and they continue today to do some really great work down in Newburn. So um, my wife and I used to drive to Atlanta to get their food and now we just have to drive down to Newburn and pick up our box every week. So um, question for both of you, Jenny and Nicholas, just to tell us a little bit about your personal journey that led you to farming in our community. And you'll unmute. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I um, started farming in 1994. Uh, so I keep, I always uh, tell myself it's only been 20 years, but it's been more than that. <laughs> um, and uh, I started really small and then um, grew into a much, big, much bigger farm now. Uh, but really what brought me to farming is more the fact that uh, I grew up, we always had a, um, a fairly large vegetable garden. And I remember being 14, 15, 16 and having to work in the garden. And uh, I didn't really enjoy it back then because um, I had to get up early and go shovel chicken manure. And it was not, uh, it's not what I thought I would be. I got my way back to the farm after I tried, um, I have an international business degree from UGA and I tried to do business uh, selling stuff and, and I realized that it just wasn't for me. 
And then uh, just the idea came, I was talking to a friend and trying to figure out what to do when I was 24 years old. And I just told me eventually I'd like to have a farm. And then out of, um, you know, like a little came out of my unconsciousness, like, hey, but you do have a, this piece of land that at the time my mother owned. Uh, in the meantime, I've bought, it, bought the land from her. Uh, and then I just started really small. And, um, and then we, uh, yeah, started really small, started driving around, selling a few vegetables here and there. And over time, we did the square market in Covington. We started the Morningside Market. Uh, we dealt with a lot of restaurants. Um, so we've marketed our, our produce through Whole Foods, different companies, different restaurants, different avenues. Uh, and now we find ourselves in 2020 uh, still doing it. And um, really the demand is, uh, I found it to be bigger than ever. Uh, more people are seeking this kind of food out. Um, there's a big push to be healthy and, and eat healthy. There's a big push for folks to support local businesses, including local farms. And so here we are in 2020 and um, yeah, we're still going strong and um, still working hard. And then Jenny joined me in about five, six years ago. And so with uh, Jenny's help, we trans, uh, we used, uh, we do more online sales now because that's also kind of the future uh, and it is a future. And so uh, Jenny's been handling all that. And then we also are transitioning some of our, uh, land to uh, growing medicinal herbs, where there's also a huge demand um, nationwide, really. Most of the herbs that are used in medicine are being imported. In our mind, that there's a big demand for small batch medicinal herbs. And so about three years ago, Jenny started doing some research, trying to figure out what grows well in this climate. And she can tell you more about that. Uh, but we also find that that business there is growing. So vegetables, is one, but then also um, medicine is the other. Mm -hmm. And I'll add a little to that. I mean, to, to kind of endure what you explained in 2020, I guess it was March once COVID and all of this happened, we actually left the Morningside Farmers Market after 25 years as an anchor vendor there and transitioned to um, just an online farm store. And so that's been a huge shift in our business um, model, but also it's been very well received and really um, has done really well. There, it's got a lot of support from not only our Atlanta customers who would drive out to see us, they were longtime customers of the market, but also we've seen the local community really step up and support that online store as well. Previously, we did more of like a CSA type model, we called it a farm box, and we saw our local customers, I mean, Maurice being one of them, that really liked the transition of being able to shop and buy what you wanted on a weekly basis just versus just getting, you know, a CSA share. Um, so it's been well received all the way around. So, but definitely, you know, a huge shift for our business overall to have to change to completely online and not do, you know, any more farmer's markets. So um, yeah, we're grateful for the online platform as well. Well, if you would, why don't you just tell us a little bit about the recipes that you put together for us and the ingredients that were featured there. I'm I've made part of it this evening. My wife's in there working on the other part. <laughs> yeah, so we did, um, well, one of them was the calendula tea. So um, calendula is a medicinal herb that we grow. The calendula flower is very supportive of the immune system, among other things. So this time of year, um, it's a wonderful addition to your winter wellness sort of routine. Um, so you would find dry calendula flowers and just to make a simple tea, you know, with boiling water, steep the flowers. You could add some cinnamon and honey would be really nice with that. Um, and then we did a root vegetable um, roasting mix. So you may have to help me remember. Mm -hmm. Beets, carrots, turnips, sunchokes, sweet, sweet potatoes. Um, so five root vegetables with some rosemary, lemon thyme, roasted. Um, and then we also included some of Nathan's from Camp Twin Lakes, some of their grass fed grass finished beef cube steaks. So we had a really simple recipe for frying those up. Um, so yeah, that was our recipe. All right. You made me hungry, but that's so good because it's, <laughs> it's going to be ready when I get off here. <laughs> and you mentioned the beef. So uh, we got Nathan on from Camp Twin Lakes. And, and Nathan, maybe tell us a little bit about the farm and, and how long the program has been in place at Camp Twin Lakes. And then also a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, we're 
the farm that I work at and manage is based at Camp Twin Lakes, which is a camp um, in Rutledge, and it focuses on kids with um, disability, illness, or life challenge. And so um, we're a nonprofit, and we work with uh, 60 other nonprofits throughout the state um, and bring in um, basically work with people who have 60 different diagnoses from um, uh, predominantly children. So for example, one in a typical year, one week might be kids with cancer. The next week might be kids with developmental disabilities and so on with 60 different partners. And um, eight years ago, I came here to manage the farm and we've grown it from a fourth of an acre uh, or three fourths of an acre garden to um, we have about 130 acres in production now, 120 of that is pasture. And so um, we do grass fed beef, which is probably our signature um, uh, product that we produce at the farm, but we also do um, laying hens, we do bees for honey, and um, we have uh, two acres of vegetable gardens and um, up to four acres, but usually no more than two at a time. And, um, and then lots of goats and miniature cows and alpacas. Um, we do get yarn from the alpacas, but they're mainly just super friendly, well socialized animals. And so all in a typical year, all the food that we produce goes to our dining hall. And so when a kid eats a burger, it's from our uh, cattle that were born, raised on site, uh, fed our grass um, with a, you know, a tomato that was grown here and lettuce that was grown here. Um, same with tacos and things like that. And then the other part of what we do is a farm based education. And so we have an outdoor kitchen, a teaching garden, um, all the, the program animals that kids get to interact with. And we do a lot of um, course food, where your food comes from, nutrition, education. Um, we'll even have kids go out and harvest ingredients to learn to cook it in the outdoor kitchen. Um, but also farms are a perfect place to get um, people interested in things like science, and um, even some kids in, are interested in business aspects at the farm. And um, so, yeah, that's an overview of, of the farm and what we do. I would say a highlight is that we took um, 80 acres of diseased pine forest and we uh, cleared that out working with the um, NRCS and other sustainability groups because that was causing erosion, um, causing disease to spread into nearby forests. And so we took that um, with the no use of chemicals at all, took that out and now it's a beautiful uh, 80 acres of, of grasslands that are sucking carbon out of the air, uh, using animals to rebuild that, all the, um, the um, all the problems that we're having with that area are solved. And now we've got these ha uh, fat, happy cows running around and we're able to create an ecosystem um, with, with those animals um, working with, you know, what we had going on. And then quickly, um, I spent my twenties um, living and traveling abroad and uh, at the age of 28 moved into this little, um, village in South Korea on an island named Jeju and um, it was me and a hundred elderly Korean women uh, were basically the residents of this town and two uh, Buddhist monks and they just started knocking on my door to add, you know, ask for help in their gardens and um, so that got me curious. I was a music and uh, uh, English teacher and loved teaching and so when I came back um, at 30, I worked at a 15-acre vegetable farm and I learned, but I missed the education piece. So that kind of brought me uh, full circle back to camp where I could do agriculture and the education piece. All right. That's great. Thanks for, thanks for sharing and thanks for being part of our evening. I'm happy uh, to be here. 
I've known Sarah Vincent as long as I've been living in Covington and Sarah and I've been on several nonprofit boards through the years. We, we can't decide who's following who, but we seem to keep ending up in these uh, grassroots organizations. And, uh, but um, Sarah and, uh, and her husband, Randy, have been involved in a lot of different aspects of sustainability, her farm, um, their work as developers, but uh, Sarah drives an electric vehicle. She and Randy installed solar panels in their home last year as part of our Sustainable Newton program. So uh, definitely walking the walk. But Sarah, maybe tell us, you know, your journey into farming and how, you know, what inspired you to, be, to farm and what inspired you to, to make it an organic farm? Well, my farm really grew out of uh, my home garden. In fact, some of these other farmers tonight might look at it and say, oh, it's a, it's a large home garden. Um, but probably about 12 years ago, I had my home garden, but I was also teaching middle school and gardening with my students. And they were over in Clarks Grove where there is a um, community garden and they were gardening really successfully. And they started selling some produce. And I found myself um, kind of filling in with some of my own produce and really enjoyed that. So when I left education, I kept going. And, and we had, with the students, we'd kind of built up a small customer base, um, but I've continued to grow that and offer delivery to, um, in the Oxford College area because Oxford College people were some of my first customers. And, and then also in Covington around the square um, and then I also offer, um, how, you know, pick up at the farm and I'm a small farm, but, you know, I managed to, I feel, um, keep my customers happy, supply a lot of vegetables because, uh, you know, not doing a farmer's market where I'm just, if I'm going to harvest something, it's sold. So, mm -hmm. And then also like um, Jenny and Nicholas were saying that people can pick what they want. Um, they don't have to order every week. So I think they like that. So, you know, I've just really enjoyed, um, you know, meeting people in that as a farmer. Um, and then as far as organic farming, I have horses and I had horses and I had my, my home garden, but uh, my horse is out in the pasture and I would pick up the manure and just noticing that the grass under that manure was always the healthiest grass and so it just made sense to compost the manure and get it back into the garden or get it back onto the fields and then since then we've added chickens so it's the same type of thing and um and really i've known nicholas since my our kids our oldest kids who are now about probably to turn 24, uh, we're in play group together beginning at two years old. So I really still remember all the things, visits Nicholas would come over and make some comment, you could grow arugula here. <laughs> you know, you need to get a high tunnel. Um, so we added the high tunnel and it's just, it's been a great, great um, journey. Great. Tell us uh, about the recipes that you've shared with us and the ingredients that were featured there. Okay. Well, they're very simple Monday night recipes. So we had the balsamic vinaigrette with green garlic and honey mustard. And I saw Bill Couch on here. Um, the honey came from his farm, Happy Dog Farm, and it is absolutely the best honey I've had. So I always enjoy making that um, dressing because I can, you know, lick the spoon after <laughs> I did that um, today. <laughs> the honey in. And then everyone um, who ordered received a uh, butterhead lettuce, which uh, is doing really well this year. And um, in this cool weather, the lettuce is, is doing great. And then also we did a um, parsley, green garlic, and turnip green um, pesto. And uh, one other thing for the salad were Hakari turnips and there's a little white sweet salad turnip. So once I, one of the things I wanted to do is make sure there was no food waste. So we had those 
turnip greens left over, I thought, oh, we'll put them in the pesto. And it actually added a lot to the pesto. Great point. And I was going to make that if you hadn't, that, you know, when a recipe uses the entire plant, there's not anything that you throw out. And we'll talk in our breakout groups about, you know, how food adds to our carbon, but that's a big part of it is the waste, the food that goes in the trash. So uh, in this case, if you thought that Sarah's kit, <laughs> there's no waste. <laughs> you were eating everything. That's right. All and right, one thing I'll say yeah. about the green garlic is it's really probably unusual to have green garlic this time of the year. And I didn't plant it any earlier than I normally would, but I think the soil was just so warm. It <laughs> grew like crazy. So I've started harvesting it. And luckily I planted quite a bit. We'll have it all winter. All right. Thank you. And then I mentioned the Oxford College Organic Farm, Catherine Reuter, who's here with us tonight. Um, if you don't know the farm, uh, it's, um, it's on, uh, as you go out of Covington into Oxford North on Highway 81, it's on the right, just north of Bunnell Road. And uh, the land was donated in 2011. The operations there as a farm began in 2014. And a lot of the food normally goes into the dining hall uh, for the last uh, bit of time before the students came back this fall. Obviously, if you're a farm producing food and suddenly there are no students there, uh, the CSA has always been a big part of their uh, offering, but this year it was especially important to get the food to people that could use it. And um, so, um, but thank you, Catherine, for joining us here. Maybe tell us, you know, first of all, about your personal journey into farming and then also a little bit about the uh, college farm and its dual role as a working farm, but also an educational laboratory. Sure. So um, uh, I'm Catherine Reuter. I'm the field manager at the Oxford College Farm. I've been there for almost three years now. And uh, I kind of took a circuitous route to work on the farm, actually. Um, I got, I studied biology and uh, traveled around doing different wildlife, uh, wildlife management jobs. After I graduated, I thought I was going to be a field biologist. Um, I ended up actually getting my master's studying freshwater ecology. So looking at streams and biodiversity and uh, fish. Um, but while I was doing all of that, uh, I really saw how interconnected land use, uh, particularly agriculture was to uh, the health of our streams and our ecosystems. And I kind of got tired of just documenting uh, how bad things were going for our wildlife and kind of wanted to be part of the solution. And so started getting more into sustainable agriculture um, as a way to have a, a positive impact on these natural systems that I loved so much. And so I ended up here at the Oxford College Farm. And I think I have the best job at the farm because uh, like I said, I'm the field manager and I just get to farm all day. Whereas my coworker, uh, Daniel, or my boss, I should say, who was supposed to be here tonight, he's our farmer educator. And my coworker, Ruth, is also a farmer educator. So I keep the farm humming along in the background while they do all the education <laughs> and a lot of the, the bookkeeping and stuff that I don't have to do. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we work as a, a, a team um, because like Maurice mentioned, uh, we're a production focused farm. So uh, Oxford College is part of Emory and it's the first two years um, and all the students are pre-professional. There's no ag school at Emory. They're all gonna be lawyers or doctors. A bunch of them are going into business. Um, and so we're not teaching farmers. Uh, we're really trying to produce educated consumers um, and just educated citizens so that they know more about the food they eat um, and can be more discerning as they become adults and have, you know, can use their buying power to make change. And so, um, uh, we have our CSA and we sell a large amount of our produce to the dining hall um, and also to the Emory Hospital and the main Atlanta campus, uh, they also buy from us. So even though we had reduced student population at the Oxford campus, uh, the Atlanta Hospital still needed produce and so we were still selling a lot to them. Um, so it's kind of neat to be part of this larger network that is Emory, it provides us with a lot of different outlets that and, you know, a farm that wasn't part of a college wouldn't have. Um, and so our students, since they're not studying agriculture, uh, they kind of come down to the farm in a couple of different ways. So we have students that have work study and they choose to work on the farm. Um, 
And we usually have about 20 students each year that work on the farm and they're engaged in every part of the farm, harvesting, planting, washing dishes. Um, we truly try and let them have a diverse experience. And then we have students that come down as part of their coursework. And there's obvious connections like ecology, biology, but we've had classes as diverse as uh, film come down, uh, uh, anthropology, uh, economics, um, just really, really everything. We're constantly trying, well, I shouldn't say we, Daniel and Ruth are trying to, to make those connections because food is connected to so many different parts of our lives. I mean, art classes have come down, um, a little bit of everything. And so just trying to help our students see how, how you know, food and the growing of food and uh, the preparation of food is connected to so many different parts of their education. Um, we also have a small field trip program. So we try and bring younger students to the farm as well from uh, the local elementary school here in Covington. And, um, and, and now, that, um, now that I've been here for the last three years and we're starting to, to really work even more smoothly as a team, I think that Daniel and Ruth have a lot of really big ideas of how they wanna grow the educational opportunities at the farm. Um, so we're excited for COVID to end and kind of explore all yeah. these new ideas we've been having. Indeed. Um, I'm sitting here watching my soup get cold that Daniel provided the recipe. Just about the recipes and that you guys featured and the ingredients. Sure, so um, the, uh, the African squash is uh, uh, a neat story where um, a farmer Uh -oh. And Daniel's been growing it for years and years, ever since he got his hands on it um, from that original person. And we don't save a lot of seeds at the farm, um, but we do save our African squash seed every year. Um, that's one thing that we save our own seed for. And it's delicious. It's one of the sweetest squashes I've ever found. And the deer even like it. They will reach through the fence and try and eat it. You'll see big bite marks out of the side. And if you guys and, haven't seen it, it takes two hands to handle. <laughs> yeah, they, they can be pretty massive. Um, but, you know, they've got a lot of neck. So there's not a lot of waste, you know, you don't have to use a lot of seed. And then, um, so that was going into a butternut squash soup. Pretty classic. Um, it's one of Daniel's favorite recipes that he makes pretty often. Um, and then we have a, a mix of collards and Amara greens and carrots, you know, three winter staples, those dark leafy greens and carrots. And the Amara is a really interesting mustard green. I really like it. It's got kind of a, a cheesy flavor, I think. So it's nice mixed with the collards that are kind of a more straightforward greens flavor. Um, it just adds a little bit of interest to what normally would just be greens. Okay, thank you. And I didn't say this up front, but um, Hopefully some of you actually were able to order uh, some of the meal kits and, and cook some of these items before, during, or after this evening. I'm, uh, when we're done, before we wrap up, I will post this here in the chat, but also if you registered for this dinner, you'll get an email. And I've, we've put together sort of, you know, a recap of how you order from each farm. Uh, how you connect, communicate, ask questions, and then also uh, how you can learn more about Drawdown Georgia and how you can learn more about Sustainable Newton. So um, that will be forthcoming. Uh, and if all else fails, just get in touch with us any way you can, and we'll hook you up with, with our local farms because, um, like I say, you know, that's, you're what make it local. So we'd like to see the food being put to good use here in our community and not having to go other places. So all right, is the we're going to come up now on the breakout portion. And what we're going to do is I'm going to as best I can divide the group up so that we put you guys into a conversation with a smaller number of people. Uh, I've got um, members, fellow members of Sustainable Newton, Lois Upham, JJ Hayden, Theodosia Wade, and Mary Darby, who will facilitate each of the breakouts. And then I'm um, trying to try to put one of our farmers in each group. There are some scripted questions that the uh, folks from Civic Dinners in Drawdown, Georgia have provided. Again, they're about getting us all to think about where our food comes from, what's in it, what we do with it when we're done, what we do with what we don't eat and so forth. So 
I'm going to put us into these breakout groups for um, about uh, 30 minutes. Uh, and then I'll give you a five minute warning uh, when it's time to reconvene and we'll come back together just very briefly. So I think we'll be able to finish, uh, you know, earlier than the 730 we put in the invitation, but we don't want to keep you all night, but we do want to get everybody's voice into this because uh, this is a movement, you know, this to, to achieve the, the very important and very aggressive objectives that the Drawdown Georgia folks have, have established, we all need to do something different and food is, touches all of our lives. So it's probably one of the areas we can do more than, than anywhere else. So I'm going to put you in the breakouts. I'm going to try to pop around and drop into a few of them. But then, like I say, I will, um, I'll send a message out to each group and pull you back. So just sit tight for just a second while I go through the mechanics here of breaking us out. Well, I think we've just about got everybody back. I'm actually not sure how to tell that. But <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, welcome back. And um, I, I hope it was uh, enjoyable for you guys. It was miserable for me because I kept dropping in to each conversation and wanting to stay and, and having to go with somewhere else. I, and then I would hear one of you talking about something. Like, oh, they need to, you know, I should have started moving you around, but I figured that might, that might be too... Uh, um, discombobulating. So anyway, thanks for the great conversation. Thanks for the uh, facilitation. Those of you that did that, thanks for the um, everybody's uh, participation. I, I hope that um, that you got something out of this. I've got several um, housekeeping things to do here. And one of them is that the folks at uh, Civic Dinners want me to take a screenshot. So I think they're gonna be freaked out when they see all the people we had at one time, but <clears throat> we made it work. So give me just a second on that. You know, Maurice, the, uh, uh, I noticed the recording button going on as we had our various sessions. So if someone wants to come back and uh, sort of uh, look at what the other sessions have to say, they can probably eventually come back to our website. Yeah, I, I meant to. That say up front but it, it doesn't record the breakouts it only records uh, the initial part and so and okay. I, I i would have told everybody that you didn't have to you're not being recorded if you didn't want everything you said recorded but the, the first part <laughs> would be because we want to to get the word out you know and and introduce as many folks as we can to the to the great work that our farmers are doing in the community but the the breakouts aren't part of that so um I'm going, as I said, um, when we're done, um, I'll email everybody with a link that has uh, the website information, social media pages and ordering links for each of our farms so that you guys can uh, follow up and hopefully um, experience some of the things they have to offer as the seasons change. And in that also will be some links to get to more information about Drawdown Georgia. And one of the things you might want to consider is, you know, finding on their website how to join a, a, a civic dinner on one of the other topics, electricity, transportation. I know we have some folks with electric vehicles. I know we probably had some discussions, some of the breakouts about people who've installed solar in their homes. So any number of ways to get involved. So that will be on the uh, Drawdown Georgia site. And, if you did not register um, for this event, um, I would ask you to um, go back and, and still register. The, the folks with Civic Dinners want to send a um, um, survey to everybody who participated. So um, if you could do that, that will make sure that they have a way to get in touch with you. And that'll make sure you get um, informed about upcoming events that they have. Um, so, uh, with that, I will pause just a minute if anybody had any questions, any, any thoughts that they wanted to share. Maurice, I, I did want to ask a question. Um, 
we had mentioned the movie Kiss the Dirt at some point. Is that something that we're projecting that we're, is, we'll make available? Yeah, so the, the film is Kiss the Ground. It's, it's a documentary. It's actually, um, we had, this one of those things where some months back I made contact with them. They were releasing the film in the U.S. and encouraging people to do screenings. I mean, they're, they really were hoping to have in-person events and the circumstances of the pandemic made that un impossible. But uh, we were going to do a virtual screening. We've done that for other films, uh, 2040 and Story of Plastic. And for some reason, I've gotten to this loop where I'm not getting a response from them now, even though they're still emailing me about other great things they're doing. So I hope we can still do that. But if you have Netflix, the film is available out there. It's called Kiss the Ground. If you have, uh, you can go on Vimeo. Uh, and screen the film, I think the cost is $2 or maybe $1. Uh, if we can get that worked out, we'll still do that, and then it will be free. But uh, I having watched it myself, it's well worth $1 or $2 or whatever you might have to pay. And also, um, I, I'll go back and add it, but uh, if you just Google Kiss the Ground, you'll get the, there's a nonprofit and then there's the movie, uh, but uh, they regularly have, you know, a page where they've got organizations like us that are doing screenings. So you can probably find one that you can join. Like this weekend um, was Saturday was uh, World Soil Day. And so um, Kiss the Ground, the nonprofit actually had a, um, an, a series of webinars on Saturday. And with that, you could screen the film for free. So I'm sure there are ways to do it. And I, I really definitely recommend it. I know that I enjoyed it greatly. And it's very uplifting um, to see, just as we see here, the farmers, the ranchers, you know, people who have made a substantial personal commitment to growing food the right way, to, to caring about um, what what they put out there for people to consume and, and what it does for the planet. So it's a really great movie. Uh, and if we can, we'll still try to at some point do a um, do a um, virtual screening that we host. But uh, and we'll be looking for other films to do that too. So anyone else? Let's make sure there's nothing in the chat here. Um, okay, well, like I say, someday we'll all do this again and we'll be together, but uh, it's uh, the next best thing, and uh, appreciate you spending eh, an hour and a half or so of your Monday evening. Uh, please um, do uh, stay in touch, look for, you know, look at things on our uh, social media and website for Sustainable Newton, and uh, help get the word out about Drawdown Georgia. Again, thank you everybody, farmers, facilitators, folks, and guests that made this possible. And everybody have a, a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.